Ilkil Nazara, and Professor Asim Khwaja, Director Center for International Development, Harvard University. Good morning, Mas Nadim, Pak Swa. Good evening, Pak Asim. Good morning. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Happy to be here. In the next hour, we will talk about translating evidence into action, the delicate dance between policy and knowledge makers. The challenges in making policy decisions are increasingly complex and interconnected. Ideally, we need evidence at each stage of policy making, from identifying the problem, deciding the response, evaluating what works and what doesn't. Without evidence, policymakers must fall back on intuitions, must fall back on uh, anecdotal evidence or ideology. Uh, the need of evidence-based policymaking seems obvious. Putting the practice in, putting the principle into practice, however, is another matter. In the next hour, we will discuss why evidence-based policymaking is easier demanded than done, and what can be done and then followed by answering the written questions from the audience. I would like to inform the audience along the discussion, you can write your question at the chat panel. I would like to start this discussion by asking Mas Menteri, Mas Nadim, knowing the importance of collaboration between knowledge makers and policy maker, the main question is why the dancing rarely happen. Minister Nadim, why would the existing research be difficult to be translated into policies? What are the obstacles, Mas Menteri? It's a very good question. Um, I think that to, to explain all the reasons, I think it would take a very, very long time. How many days do you have <laughs> to, to describe this? But I, in, in my opinion, the biggest problem, I think, is the process itself of bureaucratic decision making. So, you know, part of the reason why the only way I am noticing now what the problems are was because we made, uh, when I started the ministry, uh, in the ministry, we made a conscious effort to actually rectify those problems and essentially broke down silos between social sector, private sector, academia, uh, and, and, the, and the ministry itself. Um, so I had to go the other way around. I, I went 180 and I basically created islands of teams outside of the ministry to support uh, myself. And I have a technology island that supports us. I have a, a policy island. Uh, I have a character development island. I have an assessment island. I have all kinds of islands that work uh, as if they were part of the ministry, but they're actually located outside. So, so I had to go the extreme to finally realize what exactly were the obstacles to begin with. And I think that the biggest obstacle in evidence-based decision-making is the process. It's very easy to blame academia and saying that academia is all siloed. Everyone is siloed within their own world. So I think governments need to play it. They need to be a lot more accountable, in my opinion, for managing that process more effectively. So uh, usually the, the, the usual ex uh, reason for this is, okay, academia don't really mingle with policymakers as much um, and, 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 and bureaucratic processes are, you know, they don't factor enough people who actually know the subject and they make decisions politically or in snap based decisions that are, that are quick in nature to solve the problem in the short term. Yes, a lot of this is correct. I've seen it uh, myself, not just in Indonesia, I've seen it happen everywhere else in the world. I just recently read uh, the book by President Obama uh, on a promised land. And, you know, a lot of things there are also as, as haphazard as even uh, in Indonesia and other countries. So my, my, I think the, the breakdown of silo is primarily the responsibility of government. And to do that, you cannot assume that your team is the only team within the ministry that needs to operate. You need to have various operating bodies of expertise and not just expertise. I cannot stress this enough. There is no point in having expertise only if you do not have a team that is able to execute on those recommendations and advices. And so just as effective are the people that may not have the expertise, but are experts at executing. Okay. Without this, there's no point in having the smartest people in the room that know the data. Right. So, so the combination of these three factors, decision makers, 
executor, uh, executors and um, uh, uh, or data holders, knowledge makers, whatever you want to call them. They need to be this kind of trifecta uh, within any government operating body. Uh, and I think that, that most of the obstacles uh, revolve around process. How many of those heads were in that meeting uh, that make that decision? Did the leader of that meeting actually ask everyone's opinion and challenge and ask for the data before making a decision? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are things that I, I see a lot happen and, and it's quite frustrating, to be honest, uh, coming from a background that was very, very data evidence uh, uh, heavy. You know, it, it can be challenging, but it's doable. It's totally fixable. Yeah. With just a little bit of, of uh, uh, intensive collaboration. Thank you, Mas Menteri. I think it's very fascinating that we only we do not only just need the two, the policy makers and knowledge makers, but also the importance of the effort on executing implementation. And process is the most important uh, things. Yes. I, I think like this is fascinating. And I would like to turn to Pak Swa, especially Pak Swa has have two hats as a professor and but also as a vice minister. What are the factors that you face now, Paswa, as a vice minister that contribute to the problem? What are the things that you wish fellow academicians will do more or do less, Paswa? Uh, thank you, uh, Bu Pipi. Uh, I think uh, there is always an assumption that uh, if we produce a lot of uh, research, then the research will be taken by the bureaucracy uh, altogether. And the bureaucracy will eventually just take it up in, as part of their deliberations. Uh, that assumption is wrong. Uh, a lot of academia can write the journals and have the uh, subsection on conclusion and policy recommendations. But the bureaucracy is uh, not reading journals. So we have to force the bureaucracy to read journals. A lot of academia write the uh, write the uh, not only journals but also papers and uh, uh, thesis and dissertation and also and others. The question how to get uh, how to get them into the 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 the, the bureaucracy uh, sphere. Now I'm not only talking about the the bureaucracy that has to change. The academia has also need to change. Have to talk more with the bureaucracy. Have to be able to. To, to, to deliver the ideas that are uh, acceptable to the bureaucracy. On the other hand, the bureaucracy has also to change. They must change. And in what extent? Bureaucracy needs to be more knowledgeable. Bureaucracy needs to read more. Bureaucracy face their own political sphere. Uh, bureaucracy uh, face their own uh, socio-economic and communication uh, with the politics with the media, with the, they need to understand more. And then very important in that perspective, uh, Bu Fifi, is that the bureaucracy needs to ask questions. I see. This is where sometimes it's lacking. Bureaucracy that, that think that, that they know the answers and they refrain themselves from asking questions. Now, the questions should be absorbed by the academia. The academia should be able to absorb the questions that are around in the socio-economic life, uh, including the bureaucracy, and try to address that. This is, uh, this is uh, by assumption, we always assume it's happening, but then in the real life, Bufifi, I think there has to be some policy broker, somebody uh -huh. between the two, the academia who will continue to produce knowledge and the bureaucracy that continues to ask questions and uh, try to be very, very uh, uh, sensitive to politics, to socio-economic uh, uh, ideas. And there has to be somebody who can translate the knowledge into bureaucracy language. This is not easy. Uh, in, my, in my life, I've been very, very fortunate to be uh, in several capacity of doing that. But we have to be uh, very uh, uh, concerned about who can translate the knowledge into the bureaucracy language? Bureaucracy has its own language. Policy has its own language. Uh, academia also has uh, its own language. I think that's uh, my view, uh, Bu Bibi. 
it is interesting that uh, uh, you mentioned about the importance of addressing the mismatch of languages. And also simi uh, uh, similar to Pak Nadim, there is a need of another one who makes sure that the dancing or the evidence translate into actions. Uh, in your, uh, like this is like someone who make the more down to earth and like making sure that like, what's being put in the journal paper is something that can be understandable. So I think that uh, this is a very fascinating uh, insight about like what are the obstacles. Let's turn to Pa Asim's uh, from the other side, like which is like more of a, from like the experience being a professor in Harvard University. What do you think about the obstacles, Pa Asim? Is it a problem? Paswa mentions about like a lot of like the the research knowledge uh, in journal paper. Is it a problem that the incentives do not align? One of the complaints uh, is about this mismatch of focus. Uh, the policymakers focus more on practical applications. The research community seems to be more interested in niche issue, complex and challenging for journal publication. How can we make the incentives more aligned? Uh, great, thank you, Vivi, um, and thank you, Minister and Vice Minister. I, I'm going to build up on some sort of excellent comments uh, both of them made. Uh, I love what uh, Minister Nadim said about islands and sort of creating. Uh, I, I think it's particularly appropriate given you're in in Indonesia, but but also I think there's some there's a beauty about islands as long as islands are connected. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to kind of build up on something Minister Nadim said, which is, and also Vice Minister Sohail said, which is. You know, these are communities. So when you think of any community, a community of practitioner, a community of implementers, a community of bureaucrats, politicians, a community of researchers, and even within researchers, remember there are many disciplines. Uh, it is very important that each of these disciplines do live in their islands. They, they have rich communities of their islands. Um, and I think that the, the question for us is, how do we get these islands to connect to each other? Um, Minister Nadim has created islands which are clearly in connection with the ministry. Um, but what I love about this island analogy is on those islands, you could also land researchers on the islands, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because, um, and, and I think Vice Minister Sohasil said this as well, which is you need safe spaces, you need spaces for experimentation, you need spaces of translation. And often when you create these sub-communities, you can actually both create the rich ecosystem each community needs to grow, but also the communication network. Now, how do you create that communication network? And, and you, you asked something about incentives. So to me, actually, there's a lot of good news here. Um, and I'm, I'm fairly optimistic uh, about this. So, so let me speak first from academia and then obviously um, Minister Nadim having come both from the private sector and the public sector uh, and Vice Minister Swasil having come from the academy and the public sector can, can, can add more, uh, more, more meat to what I'm just saying. But from a research perspective, the good news is what you said, you know, researchers are interested in complex kind of niche problems. You know, it's beginning to change a lot. If you think mm -hmm. of the Nobel Prize in Development Economics, you know, Abhijit Banerjee, mm -hmm. uh, Esther Duflo, Michael Kramer, a lot of what they celebrated were not just sort of experimental techniques, but very much this idea that top-notch research can be done by asking questions which are of immediate policy interest. Mm -hmm. So this idea that we could be publishing in top journals, be, but working on burning policy issues is something I think that this, this sort of, this field has begun to celebrate. You know, closer to home, if you look at work like, you know, uh, Rima Hanna, Ben Olkin mm -hmm. are doing a lot of work in Indonesia. If you look at their work, it's very much in this thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I think for us academics, there's a, there's a very large island of academics to use Minister Medin, your language, which very much is interested in finding its ideas from the world of practice, not from a seminar, but actually from a conversation, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, Mr. Nadim, you may be dealing with on a daily basis or Vice Minister Sasil, you might be dealing on a regular basis as well. That question enriches our research. So, so when you think of, even if you define our incentives as only publishing, because the source of our richest questions is now recognized as coming from the world of practice, I think it's a lot easier to do this. The challenge is something slightly different. The challenge is that intention and that motivation is there. 
But how do you, uh, in, the, in the language that the Vice Minister Sasil used, how do you create that common broker? How do you create, um, because for an academic, especially when you think of a young academic, a junior researcher, and I would really encourage us to think not just of senior researchers, but junior researchers. And I would also argue researchers, not just sitting outside at places like Harvard, but sitting in Indonesia. You need to build your own kind of research talent. When you think of that community, you need to make it super easy for them. You need to make a, a welcome space for them. Um, if they have to spend months, and we'll talk to, about this, assume later on, getting access to information or getting access to data or getting access to policymakers. And remember, for us researchers, it's not just access to data anymore. I would say it's access to the problem solving table. You want to put the researcher on the table when that first question begins, when you're trying to figure out what really is the problem. That's where you want to welcome the researcher in. And I think creating that access requires um, sort of structures, procedures, processes, safeguards uh, that can be built. Um, I would also argue uh, it's not just building incentives for academia. I think it's very important to build incentives for policymakers. You know, by collaborating with researchers, by bringing in evidence, they need to be rewarded. And often I see in bureaucracy, people are penalized. When you take risks, remember, anytime you do something new, there's a chance you may not succeed. So you have to create a safe space for failure, actually. You have to give a safe space for experimentation. You have to reward people on the process, not necessarily just the outcome. And I think that requires some thinking. And I'm glad, Minister Nadim, to hear from you that you've created these islands, because those islands mm -hmm. can also be protective. Those islands can also create that support infrastructure. Because if you, if you can't take risks, you will never innovate, right? That's, that's the basis of research. That's a basis of kind of this sort of, I'm not saying take very risky decisions. Mm -hmm. decisions. That's what research helps with. But I am saying create a reward structure within bureaucracy that those bureaucrats who are making these connections, those brokers who are making these connections are actually recognized and rewarded. And I think that's going to be very interesting too. Thank you, Professor Asim. I think that it's interesting, like all three of you uh, mentioned the importance of having this broker. And also you talk about something that is like very important. Let's talk about access to data. I think access to data is one of the main impediment for a better quality of input. Minister Nadim, Indonesia has a lot of data, but only a few have the privilege to get access to those data. When I still work for the World Bank, I remember like we compiled around 250 micro data from different years. Some were bef uh, from before I was born, uh, Susana, Sakarna, Spodes, and many other data. But at the same time, I remember the story that Pa Ichans, professor from University of Indonesia told me. Most of his students in the University of Indonesia used the Indonesian Family Life Survey for their dissertation. Even though the most recent data was collected in 2014, because that data is accessible, while the other data are difficult to get and not free. Data can only be useful when it is being used. Are there any policy plans or interventions pa, to address the access to data problem, Mas Menteri? Well, I think as a government of the whole, even though it is not within uh, my ministry, um, there are efforts now to create some kind of a central switch of data. Whether or not that data will then be accessible to people outside of the government, that I do not know yet, right? Intuitively, uh, the more, um, as long as the data is sanitized, I see very little reason why not mm -hmm. to do this. But then again, that's me. I come from the tech sector um, where data doesn't scare me. But in a, in a world whereby um, every type of leak of data uh, is, is, is a penalty for a bureaucrat uh, in, a, in a world whereby uh, they are punished if um, a particularly bad news or bad insight that comes from a data makes the government look kind of not great, right? Um, and they get penalized for it by their leaders, then what do you expect, yeah. right? Of course, they're going to protect and create uh, boundaries around that data, uh, because because there is there there is there is far more to lose than to gain, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the short term, there's far more to lose than to gain in, in the short term. So so um, I think uh, Professor Asim is 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 right uh, in that you know governments need to work much 
uh, harder on, 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 on reducing the risk profile of the openness of data, right? Um, just, just look at the debate about, about, about uh, you know, data uh, proprietary, or like sovereignty of data and all, all this stuff. You know, it's it, a lot of people are very uh, uh, um, gung ho about this concept mm -hmm. uh, without, I think, understanding how data works. Uh, it, data, it, it doesn't matter where the data is sit, sit, uh, sits, you know, it, it, making a data in one part of a country and outside of the country does not affect its safety. Um, or in, in many ways, you know, not having the latest and greatest technology in cloud computing actually increases the risk of, of, of data theft, uh, uh, leakage, hacking, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of emotional um, anxiety mm -hmm. about this concept of data in, in, in government. But um, the, the, I agree with you, uh, Fifi, that the only way we're going to get past mm -hmm. this is by having good, sanitized, clean data, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and I would challenge you a little bit on we have lots of data. We may have lots of data, mm -hmm. whether it's good data or no, is, is, a, is a question mark, right? Yeah. No one's yeah. actually done that audit mm -hmm. uh, to, to, the, to the level of detail. And you need mm -hmm. data engineers to, and st statisticians and experts to do that audit, right? Um, data is only as good as the quality itself. So I, I would say that, I would say that the, the best solution is to create open data platforms mm -hmm. that are sanitized, that are clean data, um, and, and then able to bring in uh, universities, researchers, uh, both BRIN and universities to be able to, to and other government uh, uh, institutions uh, as well. So I'll give, you, I'll give you a few examples of what we're thinking of, right? Um, one of the things that we, we, we are very, very interested in doing is actually increasing the, the machine learning capacity of universities, right? By, by giving them supercomputers, right? This is one of our plans in the next couple of years and enabling them to get data, assuming that they're able to access some of that data and, and run analysis and research based on a, a large sample set of government data. Um, you know, the Ministry of Education will be among, I think, one of the first to offer up its data, but it depends. Data is owned proprietary by every single ministry, depending on their clear function. So you do need a clearinghouse. You need a policy that is a switch on this that enables um, uh, uh, access to that data. A lot of what is constantly being debated and focused on is data security. Very little is being discussed about data usability and openness. Um, and I think we need to shift that discussion uh, there and move on from this uh, uh, just overarching paranoia about data, which is understandable, uh, but we need to move on. So yes, absolutely. Um, just for your information, what we're doing right now by changing, we changed, we, we, we scrapped our national exam system mm -hmm. and we replaced it with something much more akin to PISA, mm -hmm. numeracy, literacy, and, and survey character. So, so values, Pancasila values, where we'll be able to test radicalization, uh, bullying, sexual violence, on top of numeracy and literacy. So it's like a PISA plus plus, okay? Mm -hmm. That is already now built on the basis of a cloud computing data infrastructure. So we built that assessment, this test that elementary up to high school schools will take. It's not to measure the students, it's to measure the school's overall shot, uh, portrait of, of how they're doing and what they need to improve on a big data cloud platform with dashboards that are shareable across different uh, directorates and departments, uh, data that is real time and able to be analyzed. It's built on platforms that you can connect machine learning algorithms if you want to, to find correlation and causation. So just to give you an example, one of our biggest big data programs are what we're doing in education. And, and my, my hope is that researchers and experts within and outside of the ministry can get access to sanitized versions of that data. As long as we're protecting the privacy of the individuals, I see actually no problem with this whatsoever. Thank you, Mas Menteri. Like, this is music to my ears as a researcher, and I think the university students among the audience are thrilled to hear commitment to address the issue. I would like to turn to Pak Swa. Pak Swa, admin data are the other data sources that can provide more insight in addressing policy issues as Pak uh, um, uh, Nadim already mentioned. Still, it is even more challenging to get than survey data from BPS. Without access 
without access to admin data, conducting a proper program evaluation, for example, can be quite daunting. So what can be done, Pak, on that issues? Uh, Bu Vivi, uh, I think there are, we are not only talking about one kind of data here. Totally. We are talking about different kinds of data, so many yeah. kinds of data. And your question to me, it's more like a more about admin data, which is I, 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 I understand what you mean is the admin data that uh, everyone in the bureaucracy says it's confidential, it, totally. is, uh, it is not publicly accessible and everything. But I would like to, uh, uh, but I would like to mention here, it is accessible. Yeah. With a proper uh, research proposal, it is accessible. Our colleagues at the MIT and JPAL, what, uh, uh, who uh, Professor Asim uh, mentioned earlier, uh, conduct uh, the very uh, good uh, uh, research on text. Mm -hmm. And the data is open. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's uh, colleagues from uh, JPAL together with Pak Khatib Basri, and we understand the topics, we understand the purpose, and we, we brought the results all the way to the ministers uh, for the, uh, the results. So it is accessible. Uh, the, but then I think your question is more about also the other kind of data. Uh, there are also things that are not accessible. For example, taxpayers' data. Of course, it is not accessible by name and address. And in this kind of, in this kind of data, I think it is will be very instructive if the bureaucracy can categorize. So the data that uh, the information, I think maybe not the data, the information uh, which will be available to the public should be uh, categorized, should be uh, tabulized uh, and summarized and everything, but it should be available for the public to see. Mm -hmm. And one example that I would like to put on the table here is that the the data on the implementation of Indonesian budget. We publish it every month. Of course, not at the level, the data, the level data that is the transaction level, because the uh, budget has transaction data, which is between the spending unit and the Ministry of Finance is a, it's a huge data. But of course, the one that we made it, we make it public are those that are very important to the public, the implementation of the budget. But for the data that are very, very transactional, transactional data, which, uh, which most likely uh, Minister Nadim dealt with when he was in the private sector, it's available. It's in the bureaucracy. And we are now pushing our bureaucracy to use big data analysis to analyze the data. So this kind of data is available. It's uh, it's there. It's our job to make sure that uh, to uh, to make sure that uh, our staff understands that we are now sitting on a very large pile, huge data that needs to be analyzed. It is true for the custom data. It is true for the taxpayers' data. It is true for the uh, budget implementation between the spending unit and the Ministry of Finance. So this kind of data is uh, uh, this kind of data is there. Another kind of data, I think, what you are also mm -hmm. suggesting that Susana's data, for example, mm -hmm. regulation-wise, we have make it very clear that the, that kind of data, like Susana's data, Sakarna's data, are produced by budget, by taxpayers' money. It should be accessible to the public. Now it's a matter, and the regulation-wise, we have make the it's possible for the BPS to charge zero rupiah, all, uh, which is free. It's just a matter of putting that in a, a good governance, how to, for everyone to get access with uh, zero rupiah uh, payment. So it's a matter of uh, operationalizing the regulation, uh, BUVP. With the operational, the, the, the regulation at the government regulation level, make it already possible. Thank you, Pak Swa. I think this is a good news. So the data is accessible, like the operationalizing and like uh, people, researchers and students can apply to get those data. This is a great news for the audience, I think. Now I would like to turn to Pak Asim. 
Professor also sometimes use funding from university or some sponsors to collect data. Like parent issues, sometimes the data usage become the privilege of the principal investigator and never be shared. How can we induce more sharing of this data so that the data can have more lifetime impact? Great, thank you, Vivi. Um, so let me let me uh, respond in two ways. First, uh, let me echo something that was said uh, by both the minister and vice minister. Um, Look, the new, the new wealth of nations, I mean, we talk about wealth of nations and what are the sources of wealth of nations. It's very obvious now that data is the new endowment. Uh, it, is, it is a source of wealth of nations, uh, right? And frankly, nations which generate more data, nations which make data, and I want to echo what uh, Minister Nadeem said, make data more usable, not just accessible. You know, there's a big difference between usability and accessibility. You know, driving intelligence from data is very different from just having data, right? Mm -hmm. So nations which make data more usable, make data intelligence more prevalent for all actors in the nation, not just researchers, not just policymakers, even citizens, right? There's really powerful uses of data through citizens. Those are the nations which will use this new source of wealth. And I think this is a this is a fundamental realization that we need to have. And I think Minister Nadine put it very nicely when he said, look, there's an initial fear we have of sharing data. What I also wanted to say is data, one of those very rare assets, like a lot of natural resources, like you have oil, you have gas, you have petroleum, you have rubber. These are, these are uh, resources which once you exploit them, you have less of them. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're private goods in it. Data is a very beautiful asset. It's one of these assets that the more you exploit it, the richer it gets, the cleaner it gets, the more usable it gets. And so it's, it's an amazing gift. And I want to make sure we all understand this. I understand the concerns of privacy, the understands of bad news that Mr. Nadim alluded to as well. And I, I've seen that with my policy counterparts a lot, that you know this idea that the minute you release data, the first news is going to be some headline news in the national newspaper about some terrible thing that the data is telling you. But I do think uh, in the long run, this is the only way any nation can succeed. So I wanted to kind of really double down on, on, on this. In terms of data being generated by academics or non-academics, um, I honestly think that while academics do generate data, and I think I'm very happy to see that in our field now, increasingly, um, there is this idea, and I've done this in my own work, which is you make the data publicly available. Um, you may have first dibs, like any patent, you may have the first few years of using the data, but then you make it publicly available. That's beginning to happen a lot. But I actually think the real world of data um, mm -hmm. um, is not the surveys we do. And I would, let me, let me say something even more provocative. It's not even the surveys governments do anymore. Mm -hmm. I think the most beautiful source of data is going to be data that people generate as they engage in the world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, let me give one small example to illustrate this point. Uh, think about one of the biggest challenges we had in this past year and are still having, which is COVID. Think about doing things like understanding how the disease is spreading, prediction models on how the disease is spreading, uh, models on are, is social distancing working or not working. All you need to answer that question is access to telco data, access to call data records. There's huge privacy issues here, but if you had access to that data flow as a researcher, as a policymaker, you could answer really big first order questions about how will the disease move? What are the hotspots? What are the bad areas? What are the areas where I should have more stringent so, uh, lockdowns or not lockdowns, right? And that data is not being generated because someone did a survey or some researcher put some money in. That data is being generated as we engage in the world. And I think we need to recognize as researchers, as policymakers, as private sector conglomerates, that as we generate this data, this data is the source of wealth of our nations. As long as we protect the privacy of individuals who are generating the data, and this is a very big uh, important thing to do. But I think as Minister Nadeem says, it's doable. It's not, it's not rocket science. It is doable. As long as we can do that, I think that will ultimately be the biggest source of data for all of us. Um, and that's where I'm sort of 
putting my money. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear Minister Naveen, you were saying that this test data is now also becoming regularly available. I think that's just a fabulous source. If you are able to do that, if you are able to check the quality both on cognitive and non-cognitive uh, literacy and values in your nation, amongst your people, I think that's just an incredible source of wealth. Thank you, Asim. I think like uh, you touched like the most important one, like this, like uh, the big data that generating, like when we engage with platforms, for example, there are new ways for researchers that to collaborate with platforms with millions of target respondents. How can we induce, this is, I would like to turn to Pat Nadim. How can we induce more collaboration between researchers and digital platform? In addition, platform also collective massive data. Mas Menteri, how can we push that the data are being used for the greater good to get inside, as pa, uh, Asim said, on big policy problems, for example, inequality, stunting, COVID, skill development, not just for inducing more clicks within the platform interface, for example. Are there any ways, Pa? It, this is a very tough question. This is a very tough question and a question I've, I've wrestled with even previously before my, uh, uh, before my current job. Mm -hmm. I think what you will find is that most people will be very surprised at how open technology companies are mm -hmm. at actually supporting policy making. Um, I think there is a, and it depends. It all depends on the individual who is in charge of that. And the key, again, this is a human organization. Mm -hmm. So it depends on their level of idealism, their level of nationalism, right? If they are a local player uh, or no. And it depends on their privacy rights mm -hmm. that their customers have signed on to. Um, US companies have a very different uh, regime. To, to Asian technology companies, for example. Um, they're much more stringent. Europeans are even more stringent uh, on this. So outside of the regulatory wise, ultimately it's going to have to be a relationship, one by one relationship issue um, that needs to be addressed. Governments and technology companies need to be close. Uh, not just because technology companies might be scared of governments doing stuff that affects their business, uh, but which is, which by the way, is a very good incentive to remain close to the government, right? Um, and so, you know, whatever works right now, I've been on both sides. So for me, the most important part is that you build these data bridges uh, between technology platforms and governments. And yes, of course, the technology companies have treasure troves of data. Um, and where it wins is not just in the volume, where it wins is in the usability. Mm -hmm. All of the data and technology companies are used to make money, mm -hmm. which means that everything there has got a purpose of analysis, right? Because they're businesses, they're for-profit businesses. Now, because of that, the reusability of that data increases dramatically. Now, the problem is, even if today we open all of the data of the government to all the researchers everywhere, the issue that uh, Asim said before about usability this is a real issue. I want to bring everyone back down to earth for a second here. Mm -hmm. There are only a very small proportion of people in the world, let alone Indonesia, that is able to sanitize and increase the usability of data. Mm -hmm. Okay. They don't have to be data scientists, but you need data engineers, you need data scientists, and you need statisticians. Okay. I'm not talking about expert domains. I'm not talking about researchers. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about these are technical mm -hmm experts that are able to uh, manipulate and restructure data to make it usable. Now, technology companies have these people. They have these people. They're very expensive people, by the way, which is why governments, especially governments, they can't really afford them, right? Because of the pay scale and everything. So part, part of the challenge here is to expand this group of talent that is able and then have the government acquire that talent that is able to make this data usable. And then you can have much better partnerships with technology companies. Because right now, the technology companies not only have to give that data, if they were to do a partnership, they have to, they have to do all this hard work to actually make the data usable, right? Most of the times, there's no, there's no place for the data to land on the government side. 
So what they have to do is they have to derive the insights themselves and then show the government and stuff. And they're not policy recommenders. They're not policy experts, right? So again, uh, what, what, what the vice minister said, Basua said about the broker, this is a perfect example of where you need this broker, right? You need this broker between technology companies and governments to, to ensure that this, but honestly, I don't think it takes incentives. I don't think you need to pay technology companies to get access to this data. I don't think so at all. I think there's already sufficient enough idealism in the tech sector, right? Uh, to, to, to want to support uh, these kind of things. They're generally younger companies full of young millennials who are uh, a, a, more activistic. Uh, they care a lot more about the environment, social justice, etc. So you just have to use that, right, as the primary motivator to support government in policy making. And we've seen in Indonesia, honestly, the amount of times that the technology sector has supported government in all kinds of rollouts and policies during the pandemic, even before the pandemic, right? The it, it's been very heartwarming to see all the unicorns, etc and the other, even the smaller technology companies jump in and support. So that's nice, but you need to make sure that this continues to be a healthy relationship. There are always factors that create sense of mistrust between technology and government and so on. So more bridges, the better. More bridges are the better. And you also mentioned about the importance of talents. Uh, like this remind me a couple of months ago, there is a viral tweet about how economic development papers mostly come from the US or Europe based authors. And recently, we also read the Times Higher Education on Asian University ranking. With the result, most Indonesian universities need to climb higher and faster. If only we have more collaboration between universities in Indonesia and other universities abroad, such as Harvard, PASIM. What are you willing to do to foster cooperation among universities and to improve the quality of research? I would like to ask each of you, what are you ready to do? Maybe start with Pasim first. I like Vivi putting everyone on the spot. Uh, <laughs> great job, Vivi. Um, yeah. Look, um, it's a great question. Um, um, for, for, for me, let me speak. I, I direct a center at Harvard, the Center for International Development. And you know, we have about 100 plus faculty affiliates at Harvard. You know, I must confess that for all of us, the idea of working in the world of practice with collaborations with practitioners, with local researchers is actually very appealing, right? If you think of the production of research now, again, starting to what I said earlier, where, where kind of frontier research is happening now, it is a very involved process. It is a process requiring teams. It is a process requiring international teams. We can't simply just fly in virtually or otherwise, grab some data set, fly out and generate great research. It just doesn't happen that way anymore. So we actually at our end have every incentive to create collaborations like these. And for me, you know, if I think of a, the, a critical triumvirate in any collaboration, it is not just the outside researcher who to, to Minister Nadim's point, does bring in some, some talent. Uh, I mean, we, we just, the problem is so big that we need talent from everywhere. It's not that we don't have talent in our own countries. It's just that the more the merrier, right? I think that actor has an important role to play. I think the local researcher, especially the young local researcher has a very important aspect to play. I learned research pretty much by apprenticeship. I learned research by working with other senior researchers. And I think, Creating that ability um, in a country like Indonesia is important. And the third is having, we have two amazing practitioners over here, both of whom um, you know, are very open to these ideas, are very open to the idea of collaborations. I think having that third element, that practitioner who's willing to welcome you um, um, and kind of build those relationships you need is gonna be critical. The last thing I want to say, so if you ask me directly, is CID willing to engage in Indonesia or country like Indonesia? Absolutely. Are we trying to do so? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Vice Minister Tohasa mentioned about the work that JPAL is doing. That's a great example of an international network which is working in countries like Indonesia. Uh, I want to end with one thing at my end, at least to do this. What is critical over here, and this is really important. Look, you can work because of your mind or your brain or the value but ultimately work only happens if you create trust between each other. We are very human in how we do, no matter how scientific we get, 
we only form collaborations, whether we are researchers, all policymakers, or practitioners, whoever we are, if there is a basic level of trust and if that trust is nurtured and grows. For me, that's the most important thing. Um, and I think the question I would pose to us all is, how do we create that circle of trust? How do we create those relationships of trust and respect, I would say, uh, which allow these these collaborations to flourish, uh, but I'm 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 game. I will. You can you can you can you can you can count me in, maybe. That's fantastic, Pa Swa. What are you willing to do, Pa? I think uh, thank you, Bupipi. Pa Asim, I I enjoyed your uh, last comment. I think it's very 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 true. It's all depends on the incentive structure. What kind of collaboration that we should have? Uh, of course the we 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 have this noble objective more indonesians should have be should have the international cooperation well yes that is good but how to build uh, how to build that number one i think pa asim's last comment is very important relationship and relationship is built not only of the not only of the uh, uh, um, trust it's also about the intellectuality i mean like a no Harvard professor would like to collaborate with the uh, Indonesians that he or she fit, thinks that doesn't fit with the, the level that, uh, that they can cooperate. It's going to be a waste of time from the, from the Harvard point of view. It's, it's real. But of course, I think in the last one or two decades, Indonesia uh, develops our capacity. More and more Indonesians are worthy of such cooperation. And we are very happy to see that. And of course, this is this is the one that Pa Asim uh, stated earlier should be nurtured and uh, developed further. I think it's very important uh, to get this critical mass. Uh, it is important that this is not only uh, among one, two, five, ten researchers. It's a critical mass that Indonesia must prepare. So that is number one to me. Number two, Indonesia has a rich data. Indonesia is known as a country with a very rich and generous data. That is a strong point that Indonesia has. So we have to continue to build upon that and allow our researchers to get data and offer the Indonesian case as a case that can be, can be globalized, that can be researched, that can be discussed in the global international arena. Num that is number two. Number three, BUPP. The access to policy. I think more and more researchers and the global researchers would like to see their ideas translated into the real policy. So the earlier uh, discussion about the poverty by Jepal is a good example and I enjoyed working with them and I enjoyed uh, in my previous life, I enjoyed getting access to their research for the poverty, uh, anti-poverty program. It is very important, more and more very important. And lastly, on my list, BUPP is about money. And for deliberately, I put money at the last of my point. Mm -hmm. It's not always about money, but money is important. That is why we have to provide money. And the uh, uh, Ministry of Finance, we provide the seed funds, LPDP. It's not only providing scholarship, it's also providing money for research. It is a trust fund kind of uh, uh, money. So we would like people to access this money. We will make our, we will do our best to make sure that the seed fund is going to be uh, uh, to, to develop and continue. Uh, but we need more and more ideas, ideas that are developed together between Indonesians and international researchers of, on the Indonesian data with a sure access to policy making process uh, that is more and more evidence based and research based. Thank you, Bu Pipi. Thank you, Pak Swa. Uh, Minister Nadim, what are you willing to do? Can I, I prefer to, to answer this question by saying what I've already done with the okay. team rather than what I, um, so, so um, you know, we can, I, I feel like mm -hmm. sometimes I'm uncomfortable promising yes. things, uh -huh. rather just show what my track record is okay. in this area, right? So um, first thing, here's what we've done. We've made research into a fully accredited full semester or one year course of study. Mm 
accessible to all students, and no universities can get in the way of it. So if anybody has an accredited research project that is immersive or anywhere, and students get accepted to it, it's as if they took four or five subjects. This is the essence of Campus Merdeka. By the way, this is not just for research. You can go teach in uh, an outer region school that needs to catch up after the pandemic for a semester and you'll get full credit as well. You can also go into a company and now every company can be a mini university. Okay, so just those two things, just think about that for a second. Any research project can bring in top undergraduate and graduate talent and have it fully exchangeable as credit in school. And they can even access funding from El Pedepo. Okay, so, so research is now part of a degree program. You can jump in and do marine conservation for six months in uh, Raja Ampat. You can do, um, uh, uh, you, can, you can support uh, REDD projects in Kalimantan. You can uh, work on a new tracing algorithm for a pandemic. And that will be as if you are doing four or five courses. And so this opens everything. It also opens the, the researcher and the docents that don't have to choose anymore between research and teaching. Their careers are accelerated by leading this project instead of actually being uh, 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 um, uh, uh, pushed back, right, in their career because they have all these obligations to teach and also do this. Now research is teaching if you bring in students into your program. So that's a huge, pretty radical change of what we've done. We've basically unbundled higher education in Indonesia. And we believe that, I think we're, we're among the pioneers here because we, in, in the world, uh, in doing this, now any company, any world-class company can be an accredited mini university for six months. So is a research project. Next thing we're working on with Bryn, we're figuring out with our limited budget, what do we do? How do we centralize research facilities, laboratories, uh, facilities that we simply cannot make for all universities and all research institutes? How do we centralize and create a few world-class research facilities that can be shared by all? Automatically, there's two benefits to this. One, we have no option. We need to do it given the budget limitations we have. The second best thing about this is that it forces because it's it's for it's like co-working space, but for researchers. The second best part about these facilities is they're mandated to be shared, okay, across universities, across research institutes, and so on. And so what we will create is, is a breaking down of silos between universities, between faculty around these centers of research um, that will be in, in some universities and in some BRIN facilities as well. The third thing we did was we, we hyper simplified the incentive structure for industry to get involved in, in industry. We created an online platform called Kadaireka. We just decided, okay, let's just do it. Let's create an online platform. Very simple concept. Universe, uh, industry gave problems and universities and, and research institutes jumped in and said, hey, I may have a potential solution to you. And what we did was we supercharged it by saying that any one rupiah that came from the industry to this research project, government would put in one too. This, I mean, we've tried so many different incentives in the past on how to get industry to be interested. We oversubscribed our 250 billion budget in two and a half months on this online platform, okay? So it's not like industry doesn't want to go and participate in, in research programs uh, and projects, innovation projects in universities. It's that we just need to simplify the model and put some aggressive incentives in there. Um, so this is super encouraging what we've seen, right? So now industry is teaching and industry is funding research and collaboration um, in, in, on, on campus. And, and thanks to the help of uh, uh, Vice Minister Swa and, and Ministry of Finance, now El Pedepe is not only funding um, uh, graduate programs and full degrees, now it's funding uh, non-degree programs, semesters abroad, research projects. It's funding researchers coming back into Indonesia from outside to come in Indonesia. It has scholarships for that. So we've really decentralized the definition uh, of, of what constitutes an, an, an education endowment fund together with the Ministry of Finance. And that's going to create a huge number of opportunities as well. So rather than me talking about what, what we've committed to, I'd rather explain what we've done. And I hope that shows that our commitment. Thank you, Pa. 
I wish I were much much younger dan bisa sekolah lagi Pak ngalamin kampus merdeka. <laughs> Tapi but I'm really glad on behalf of my daughter and on behalf of all other anak bangsa Pak. Can I, can I just uh, add one more point? Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of academics watching you. Never once we've issued eight major indicators of success, eight metrics that are most important. None of these metrics mention rankings. None of these mentions rankings. One of them said about the quality of research. And yes, there is, of course, international publications, but similarly weighted was research that was applied by other, by, by two things. It can be an innovation that actually gets applied by an industry or a downstream progress or a policy recommendation that was applied by government. We not once did we tell any universities in Indonesia to catch the any global ranking of university. Sure, we have a target from Bapanas on that, but how we decided to go about that is not to focus on those rankings, but to focus on transformation. Mm -hmm. How many implemented research, uh, uh, how many research created impact in the real world that you had in your university? How many of your students studied outside of campus? How many of your professors went outside of campus to learn sabbatical, other U campus, industry, whatever? How many practitioners are teaching on campus? How many of your degree programs are in collaboration with foreign universities or industry players or research institutions? So all we did was put input metrics to break down the silos completely. And never once did we obsess about university rankings, a lot of which are gameable. And this is a huge issue now going in the West, okay? About how rankings are creating the perverse incentives for universities. And now there's a pendulum swinging the other way and trying to move away from these rankings in the same way that education is trying to move away from standardized testing, right? So I just wanted to point that out, that it's very important that the, the, the essence and principle of push is not to chase some ranking, global ranking, but it's to create real meaningful change in the ecosystem. Thank you, Pak Nadim. Thank you, Pak Asim, Pak Swa. It has been a very fruitful discussion. Thank you for the insight and thank you for the commitment. I hope somehow this discussion will foster more collaboration between policymakers, knowledge makers, and among universities. We already passed the allocated time. Uh, there are a, quite a number of questions in the chat room, but I'm not quite sure. Probably we could try to ask one or two questions like there is one question from Darenda, Darendra about like yes there are some uh, it seems that the incentive is like, stronger for the knowledge sectors unfortunately it seems similar incentive are still unclear for policymakers to use more evidence-based policy making what he would like to hear more from especially Pak Nadim and Pak, Pak Swa on how to induce that the bureaucrat will use more evidence-based policy. Mungkin like just a crisp uh, uh, short answer, Pak. Uh, Pak Swa, mungkin dulu. Um, what is the, well, the bureaucracy needs to to continue to learn. Uh, uh, we send bureaucracy to uh, go for the higher higher education. We send the uh, graduates also to make sure that uh, Pak Nadim curriculum, new new curriculum Merdeka Belajar is very good. Uh, at some point, we expect that uh, the education system will go to the bureaucracy and use the bureaucracy as part of the Merdeka Belajar so that the, the graduates understand, oh, this is the problem that the bureaucracy face. Uh, because uh, the... I think it's very important to continue to share the bureaucracy problem uh, to the people at large. Uh, providing the incentives, and I, 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 and as I said earlier, the incentives is not only money, it's the data, it's the access to the policy, it is the, the, the critical mass, it is also, of course, it's money, it's uh, also money is always also important. So different kind of incentive we have to combine with PP. And there are so many exciting problems that the bureaucracy is faced and can be framed as part of not only increasing the knowledge, but at the end of the day, it's also about 
improving the evidence-based policy making process. Thank you. Panadim, one question for you. Uh, this is, like, I, I cannot see like who asked the question. Oh, from Diana Sari. Uh, 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 do you think that the category of journals with Scopus or with other categories still in the main reason to make article is qualified or not? Well, other universities abroad don't concern on this. Yeah, I think my whole Dicti team are, are in the process of reviewing all these okay. policies. But as you can see from our metrics that are most important, we didn't specifically mention Scopus. We mentioned uh, international publications or um, implemented research uh, in it. So, so we're really redefining the category of what is impact research. And it's not just publishing. Um, and I want to issue that uh, what, what Paswa said about, uh, um, yeah, we don't, honestly, we don't have time to read journals. <laughs> That's not the, 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 that will never happen. Uh, it's a, you can't you can't pay bureaucrats to read journals. It's not it's not going to happen. They have to be policy uh, papers and recommendations. They have to be uh, some some cases PowerPoint, depending on what leader you're talking to and how they decide their communication. So research has got to get real good at pitching. Okay, they got to get much better at pitching. Maybe you need a middleman to do that, but I do believe that policy recommendations and specific research done by government should be at the same level as also international publications um, in terms of career path uh, for professors. And I don't know why that is not the case yet. And I certainly plan to, 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 to rectify that problem. Um, and, and the Dikti team and my Dirjan Dikti Pat Nizam is a true reformer. So he's, he's, he's now reconstructing re, uh, the concept of what, what is what should count as a merit mm -hmm. in a professor's uh, a career, uh, and we're really expanding the definition. We're seeing so many great professors that are so much more engaged in their NGOs and in their social projects, and they ignore the publications. And somehow, uh, you know, they can't make that trade-off. So the the essence is enabling professors to really go by what their passion is, right? Um, and, and to be able to dwell and, and specialize if they want to. Uh, and there should be nothing wrong with that. And that's kind of the philosophy that we're bringing. Merdeka Belajar is not just Merdeka for the students. Merdeka Belajar is also for the, for the teachers and for the professors. Yeah. Thank you, Pa. Uh, pa Asim, the last question is for you. Uh, you said that you would collaborate with universities from Indonesia. What kind of collaboration? And do you think that only several universities have this possibility because of the quality of university? Let me respond. Thank you. That was a great question. Um, let me respond in two ways. One is, look, when, when one thinks of quality, it's not like a fixed commodity. Quality, just like data, increases when you collaborate. So for me, you know, you know, it's like when I work with a junior faculty member or a research assistant, the initial thing is not how good a quality you have, it's do you have a willingness to learn and do you have a willingness to kind of in make the investment needed to build quality? And that's a very different kind of question. Um, so for me, it's, it's less about, uh, is there enough research uh, existing quality or are people publishing in top journals sitting in Indonesia? It's much more are people willing to collaborate, are people willing to have that relationship and Vice Minister alluded to this as well and Minister Nadeem alluded to this as well. Are that willing to, do, to ask real questions to find real solutions. Remember at a heart, every researcher has, when I talk to young people and say, do you want to do a PhD or become a researcher? My first question is not, do you love working on data or do you like doing elaborate econometrics? My first question is, do you love solving problems? As a researcher, when we look at the world, we're fascinated by what can happen, not what is, but what is possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very powerful instinct. And that to me is a human instinct. It's, it's a lot of us have it. Uh, and so the question is to nurture it. From a more practical perspective, I mean, I love the idea of what Minister Nadine said, you know, what is difficult for us, and it comes back to the same thing, how do you identify individuals who have that burning desire? You need a clearinghouse. You know, if I, as an international researcher, someone like Rima or Ben know Indonesia well, but imagine I don't and I step in. I need some trust source. I need some central node which can tell me these are guys who have that fire in their belly. And so to Minister Nadim's point, when you have these centers of excellence, which are drawing from a diverse set of universities, 
you create incentives, you make it such that only those who really have that drive in their belly are going to show up, are going to push on the doors, are going to knock on the doors. So you, you, you self-screen, right? If you have that set of people, uh, then any outside collaborator would love it. Remember, for us as researchers, we're also teachers. I mean, I have a lot of gratefulness I have to my advisors who made me a researcher. I love paying that forward. I love finding people who have that potential, um, who have that willingness to learn. So I think if, if this central hub makes that possible, I think, Mr. Deem, that's a fabulous idea. What we have to do is how do we build linkages and collaborations um, with that, that kind of center? The last part is like, what questions would you work on? Look, I think there's an obvious one. You know, we have a once in a lifetime situation with COVID. This doesn't happen for generations. This doesn't happen for centuries. And I think all of us, and I want us to think about this very carefully, all of us, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, will be asked by the future generations to say, what did you do in the year 2020 and 21? Mm -hmm. How did you help a bleeding world? Mm -hmm. Did you help the healing process? How did you help the healing process? And for me as a researcher, that's what keeps me awake at night. And so for us at CID, the big thing we're launching is we want to do a massive five to 10 years project on not just how do we recover from COVID, but this is the first comment when Minister Nadeem and I were in the private room, we were talking about this to say, COVID is the biggest disaster. But to me, every shock, every grief is an opportunity to do something new and different. Um, to me, this is a calling. We have a point in our lives personally and collectively to do something, to pivot to something far better, to reimagine education, to Minister Nadine's point, in a way that it's not that the old education was great. We don't want to go back to that. We want to do something some, so much more powerful, so much more creative. And I think we've been given an opportunity to do it. So for me, that's the area I would love to collaborate on. I think we all need to collaborate on in every sector, whether you're a macroeconomist thinking of how you're going to rebalance the budget or your education minister thinking about how you're gonna design new education policy, or your health minister thinking about how will I heal my people? How will I, uh, and not just because of COVID, but you know, people have missed immunizations. And so I think, uh, you know, I don't want to end on a negative note. I actually am trying to end on a positive note. I think this is the time for us to build our legacies. For me as a researcher, the only way to do that is to answer some of the most important questions that the world is posing to us right now. Thank you. This is the time to build our legacy. This is the time to collaborate. Thank you again, Pak Nadim, Pak Swa, and Pak Asim. Thank you for the insight. Thank you for the commitment. Thank you, all the audiences. Hope we will see you again in the next IEA conference. Thank you. 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 Thank